Okay, so I'm recording now, but um, as I said, you can censor it if, or we'll, we'll, it won't go anywhere if at the end of the night you don't want it to, or if don't want elements of it to. So uh, tonight, what we have invited people to do is to, to share a story that's been a go-to story for them during uh, COVID to maybe say a few words of it and then we'll open it up to a conversation. So you can kind of listen to it, um, being intentionally aware of the place that you find yourself in all its complexity and then uh, hearing each passage from that place. And so I'm gonna ask you if you're not one of the presenters to mute, if you're not just so we do that and I'm gonna do, um, change it to spotlight view. And Nathan, you get to lead us off. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is going to be hi. <laughs> this is going to be from Job chapter three, and uh, it's uh, been a text that we did um, some collective Bible study, contextual Bible study with some colleagues, um, mostly missionary colleagues who had got been just sort of distributed all over the world and got kind of sucked back, some of them in pretty difficult ways, but also they find it, I, I think as many white North Americans do, difficult to actually lament and kind of, um, I don't know, like express that. And so the Bible study session that we did was, was really good. And um, so just been kind of trying to, with all the different losses in various ways, uh, embrace the, the sadness and uh, I'll try to recognize that. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Then Job answered and said, Delete the day on which I was born and the night on which they announced a man has been conceived. That day, let it be darkness. Do not call for it, God above. Do not shine light upon it. Darkness and deep shadow Redeem it for your own. Let a cloud settle upon it. That night. Let gloom seize it. Not to be counted among the days of the year or among the number of months not to enter that night. Behold that night. Let it be barren. Let no cry of ecstasy penetrate it. Let those who curse a day, curse it. Those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. Let its morning stars be dark. Let it look for the dawn but it never come. Do not let it look upon the eyelids of the dawn. Do 
because it did not shut the doors of my womb. Or hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not come out of the womb as a stillborn? Come out from the belly and just expire? Who were there knees to receive me and breasts for me to suck? Then I would be asleep and at peace and at rest. Or with princes and their gold who, who filled their burial houses with silver. Why was I not covered up like a miscarriage? Like fetuses who have never seen the light. There, the wicked protesters cease from their uprisings. And the exhausted poor are at rest. Prisoners can relax together. They do not hear the voice of their oppressor, small and great, are the same. These slaves, they are freed from their master. <coughs> Why give light? To a sufferer. Or life to one who is bitter in soul. To those. Who long for death. But it does not come. We dig for it. More than for hidden treasure. Merrily, merrily, we rejoice even to jubilation. Because they find the grave. Why give light to one whose path is, is hidden? Whom God has hedged in? For my, my sighing my daily bread and my groanings pour out like water because I feared fear and it happened to me I am not at peace not still not at rest. And trouble has come.
can either unmute or you can visually applaud. Thank you so much, Nathan. Can you just uh, remind us what that is again? Job, type that in. Yeah, so that was Job chapter three. Um, uh, actually, I did the translation for it uh, a few years ago and um, had never uh, like committed it to memory and performed it. So that was a different experience as mm -hmm. well to kind of see how it might have come out a little differently or the words came together. But I, I tried to translate it for sound and things like that. So um, it was originally part of uh, a series of contextual Bible studies we did in Ghana with people living with disabilities. Um, at, that was a few years ago. And so it was interesting to revisit it again now in the COVID crisis with um, uh, you know, kind of colleagues or peers um, and to try to uh, encourage, part of the process is to encourage people to write their own laments as part of it. And um, we had some really cool things um, in, that, in that regard. Where people expressed in their own words what they were lamenting, and that was—it was really, it was, you know, in a way, it just gives permission for something that we, many um, Christians and leaders, struggle to do. I'm I inviting. I'll invite people to send uh, Nathan your comments, as many of you are already already doing. Um, but then we'll have a few minutes at least for people's responses to verbally, if you would like, to what he gave us, what he offered us. This is a chapter that I do myself, and you did a lovely job with it, Nathan. Very, I, I was taking notes on the translation, uh, but, but your expression and emotion, they're different than the ones I would have used, but they came off beautifully, uh, so, so. Hearing hearing you do an old friend of a chapter was just really fun and thank you. It felt very timely to me. I mean, I know that's part of the point. That's what we said we would do, but I mean, Nathan, it's like, I mean, you did this whole winter is coming at the end. I don't know. I mean, like, I'd be interested in how you translate that. It felt, or I've never, um, I never translated my own um, story from from the Hebrew scriptures. So I guess I'm just kind of fascinated by that too. It just it felt it, it felt like at the end. I don't know if anybody else uh, feels this, but it felt like it felt like at the very end. I was about to like I was. I, it just felt very. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It felt very much like you were prepping, kind of Game of Thrones style, like like in the worst is yet to come. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> like very little hope, Nathan. I mean, how is it sitting with that? For me, I think it was a little bit, I mean, it's so deep pain and emotion. It was hard to perform in that sense. I, you know, it's hard to practice and it was hard to get in the space of trying to really feel that. But yeah, uh, it really, in terms of the moment and feeling these, multiple crises that have been going on and then recognizing that yeah it's i mean on one hand it's weird because we had this election too that for a lot of us i think was was good news and so that that's also um you know i think for others maybe 2016 if this had been sort of a repeat of that although we don't know you know i mean not to, not to bring that all into the whole thing but yeah it's um, also, I mean, you think of the protests and the uprisings, and so the, 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 and it says the wicked will cease from their, I think I translated it differently, the wicked will cease from their insurrection. I just couldn't get myself to say insurrection because, you know, of how that language has played more right. recently. Right, right. Yeah. It was kind of nightmarish. It felt, it was hard too, because it felt a little like, I, 
I mean, I haven't done this much emotion in performance. And so, yeah, like that, that's difficult. It's like, can you keep that much up? The whole Listen, time? you're, you're lighting it like, like, you know what you're doing too. Marty talked about the background, but the lighting as well. Like you're just prepping us for, for some rough stuff, man. <laughs> I'm sitting in the basement, so. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah, before I knew you were going to be performing Job 3, I about joked it looked like you were joining us from a prison cell. Yeah. Actually, I should say that this is a smosh from Ghana that is one you wear only at funerals. And so I intentionally wore that. I, I actually used to wear it because I liked the color until somebody said, like, dude, that's only for funerals. <laughs> so I actually wore it an appropriate, because I think in some case, you know, like, what you're wearing almost as some as those friends would walk up and sit with them, you know, um, yeah, that would tell the whole story as well. I, I've been just, I'm preparing for something else and was watching footage from Robin's Island of the prisons. Uh, Cause I'm writing a little, some, just a little bit on Mandela. And that's what it reminded me. I was like, Oh no. Wow. Yeah. It is very evocative. And that counts when you're telling stories in the 21st century. You need to have the visual as well. Good time for one more comment, and then we're going to go to Marty. I just can't get over that. That's one chapter from Job. I mean, it makes me wonder what would it, what would the performance setting have been for something like, like Job? I mean, how would that have been experienced? Uh, I mean, because that that's, that was heavy for one chapter, and of course, it's kind of <laughs> it's unremitting. I mean, it, 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 you know. It doesn't get much better uh, as, as you go on. It's, it's, I just, yeah, I can't imagine what that would have been like. Yeah, it's such a different switch from, from two to three. You know, that's where the poetry starts. And the language changes so much. I mean, you can, it feels quite different. Um, but yeah, I... I and, and at risk of um, committing blasphemy <laughs> for the network, <laughs> there's all kinds of puns in Job that you only get in writing. Hmm. So I'm not sure how much, I, I think this one may violate our usual assumption of put together entirely for oral performance. There's stuff there you only get when you read it. I mean, and I think, Marty, that's a super fascinating point because there are so many of these texts that even if they were primarily heard, there are things happening in the written forms themselves that lend itself to this sort of mixed media reception of it, which it's sort of just like layers on layers of things to pick out, which I just think is so fun. I have thought that if we did Job in uh, an epic telling, there are points where I would simply want the the teller to do it one way and then another teller to tap them on the shoulder and say, no, that's not it. Mm -hmm. And do it the other way. We're going to go to Marty next. You can tell us what, do what you know what to do. Okay. Uh, I too go to poetry. Uh, and what you're going to be doing is eavesdropping on the biblical texts I do for me in this time. I do them in Hebrew because I love the sound of the language and part of what has attracted me uh, to Psalm 90 in particular is the sound. I will do them first in English in my translation uh, to help you follow them. Uh, but this is not a performance piece. This is something I say to myself when I'm out walking. I wake up in the middle of the night. So <laughs> um, it's more like you're eavesdropping on my prayer. Uh, than seeing a piece intended for observation by other people. Uh, I'm going to do two psalms. The first uh, is 90, and it came to my attention a few decades ago when I noticed how often people named it as a scripture that really meant a lot to them. It wasn't on my radar screen at all, so, you know, I learned it and studied up on it. And then a handful of years ago, I was prepping it for presentation at my home congregation. Uh, and while I was working on it, Frank Birch Brown had a stroke 
from which he has made a very incomplete recovery. And that put existential teeth for me uh, in what the psalm is about in terms of the uncertainty, brevity, fragility, uh, and disappointments of human life. The things we wanted, wanted to accomplish and we're not going to be able to pull them off. Uh, and then this year, of course, there are all public things plus the slow decline of my mom, uh, who died in September. So I went back to it. The one thing I want to say about it is it has a lot of language about divine wrath. And I do not take that in any way literally. I don't think bad things happening is the punishment from an angry God. But I do think that's the language that ancient brothers and sisters use to talk about the pain in life. So when I hear the language of wrath in the psalm, what I hear is human experience, not an authoritative statement about God's personality. And then another thing uh, that is quite clear to me is that sometimes you need to say cheerful, confident stuff, especially when that's not what you're experiencing in life right now. So the second Psalm I am doing is Psalm 100. And it's worth noticing that both of these are from the part of the book of Psalms that deals with the totally traumatic, disorienting uh, worldview unsettling experience of exile. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, a godly man. Lord, you have been our dwelling place for all generations. Before the hills were born, or you labored with earth and world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn back humankind to dust and say, turn back you human ones. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's passed on, like a, a watch in the night. You flood them away. They're like a dream. In the morning, like grass, they grow. In the morning, they flower and grow, and in the evening, cut down and dried up. Because we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath, we are terrified. You set our sins before you, our hidden flaws in the light of your countenance. All our days pass by in your fury. We end our years like a sigh. The days of our years, among them 70 years, or maybe by reason of strength, 80 years, and their span is toil and trouble. Then snip, whoosh, we've flown away. Who knows the power of your anger? As the fear of you, so is your fury. To number our days, teach us that, so that we may gain a wise heart. Repent, Lord, how long? Change your mind about your servants. Fill us up in the morning with your steady love so that we can sing and we can be happy all our days. Make us happy as many days as you have oppressed us, as the years that we've seen evil. Make your servants see your wonderful deeds and their children your glory. And may the beauty of Lord our God be upon us and the work of our hands establish it for us. The work of our hands establish it. Tefillah Lemoshe Ish Ha Elohim. 
Adonai, ma'on ata haitalanu bador vador. Beterem harim yuladu, vetecholel eretz vetevel, ume olam ad olam ata el. Tashe venosha deka, vatome shuvu vene adam. Ki elef shanim venecha. Kayom et mo chia avor, the Ashmura Valayala. Zaramtam Shana Yahu Baboka Kechatir Yaklof Baboka Yatzit Vakalaf Erev Yemalel Vyamish Kikalinu. Apecha Uva Evra Uva Hamatka Nevhalnu Shata Avenotenu Lenikbeka Alumenu Lama Or Paneka Ko Yamenu Panu Be Evrateka Kilinu Shenenu Kamo Hega Yame Shimus Shinotenu Bahem Shiva im shana, the im big verot, Shimon im shana, Verohabam amalva oven, Gaz, quish, fana ufa. Me yodea oz a peka, Ukeyataka, Evrateka, Limnot yamenu ken hoda, Venavi levav hochma. Shuva al nai, an matai, vehenachim al avadecha, sabenu baboka cheseka, unren nav nis machal bacho yamenu, sem kenu ki mot initanu, shanot ra inu raa, yera er al avadeka fo alecha, vahadecha. Albanehem Vihi Noam Aranai Elohenu Alenu Uma Ase Yadenu Konana Alenu Uma Ase Yadenu Konanehu And then Psalm one hundred A Thanksgiving Psalm. Yell out to Lord all the world. Serve Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with shouting. Know that Lord, he is God. He made us. We are his, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his courts with thanksgiving, or his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thank him, bless his name. For good is Lord, forever his loyal love, and from generation to generation his faithfulness. Mizmor, le toda. Hariu la Aronai, kol haaretz, if do at Aronai, besimcha. Bo'u le fanav berinana. Du ki aranai, hu Elohim, hu asanu, valo anachnu, amo, vatsun marito. Bo'u sha'arav betoda, chetziratav betehala, hodu lo, barhu shamo, kitov aranai, le olam chasto, va ador vador emunato. Um, let's start out with comments that you have so we don't, so everybody can get their word in. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time for talking. I'm realizing I 
I don't want to keep re like have less and less talking as we go. So I have to pace myself. So, but we all, well, we can have a few minutes for conversation. Marty, I, I mean, I just truly appreciated uh, the the way that you juxtaposed both those those psalms, those story psalms, um, from you know the dark place into the place of joy, and you know I think that's the that's the hope that we all share. Like we're in the dark now, but we're not going to stay there. And so you know um, it it. it kind of similar to what Nathan did, but, but, but in terms of the dark part, but then you brought us into, you know, re the, the, the rejoicing part. And I think that's um, what we're all looking forward to. And that we're all maybe in new and different ways, finding those little bits of joy uh, here and there in this weird time. So I, I appreciate how you, how you balance that out. So thank you so much. I am the original Ms. Lament. And I'm always fuming about people who fix things by needing a happy ending. But you know, doggone it, sometimes you just gotta say, really, I'm sure the truth about the universe is not the way it feels right now. I thought that, that, that you looked at the camera was an interesting choice, Marty after you told us that we're overhearing your prayer, um, it, it felt different than that because of the, like we were sitting in God, <laughs> God's spot listening to it. Not, not negative, not a positive, just an observation. I, want, that it, I, want, I wondered if that would be how it would be. I mean, obviously I knew I was doing it for a group. <laughs> And, and uh, as you all know, when I'm going to do something in Hebrew, um, I tend to do gestures that I wouldn't put in otherwise to help people follow. And actually, I think that's part of the reason I like doing things in Hebrew is I am maybe a little inhibited most of the time, but I feel <laughs> totally entitled to wave my hands around. <laughs> yep. Were there any particular things in the Hebrew, like, puns or things that really came out for you in, in these two psalms that that felt different in the Hebrew than in the English for you? Not so much in Psalm 100, although that that refrain, Le'olam Chesdo, I think is arguably the center of Hebrew Bible theology. Um, that was the first verse I introduced my current Hebrew class to, just when they were learning to pronounce the letters. I said, we'll come back later, you know, to unpacking the grammar, but um, Psalm 90, the, the flow of that last verse, Vihi noa maranai aloheinu aleinu, um, sometimes when I'm doing um, workshops with people, I'll give them the pronunciation of that verse in Hebrew and use it as a refrain between the stanzas of the psalm. And I had never really noticed before uh, the verb fly away is used a couple of times at the beginning and the end. Uh, at the beginning, it says that God shuv humankind to dust. And then at the big shifting gear towards the end, it's shiva, I don't know, you, you, rip, you go back, you repent. Um, and I had never really noticed the the that gaz hish v'na ufa snip whoosh hish whoosh flying away, uh, and it echoes back to the uh, snipping of the grass, the cutting of the grass, and the withering. Those were the things I noticed that were fun. We're gonna. Um... We've done two and we've used half of our time. So um, we're gonna go to Janet. And I think at least several of the stories are much shorter than the passages we've heard so far. So that should should work out fine. I'm just trying to do my job here. So Janet, you're up. Okay, so um, a number of years ago, the 
the um, epic telling was the, the Gospel of Luke. And one of the things that I had heard as I was listening to everyone is just the angst being ratcheted up as, as the time drew closer to Jesus' um, death and resurrection. But in these last few months, Jim and I've had the privilege of, of doing a series of, parable, of parables with um, uh, a small group from a, 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 a church in a nearby town. And, and uh, we're doing the parables from the Gospel of Luke that are part of the journey, that are the stories that Jesus told on the road to Samaria. And it's that same ratcheting up of the angst that uh, interested me um, because there's so many layers of conflict in their life. Just being in Samaria, the place of, of unwelcome and not so nice, not so good neighbor relationship. Jesus knew full well, according to the Gospels, what he was headed for, and he was trying to explain that. The tension with the religious leaders, the, um, the whole oppression of the Roman uh, Empire and, and what they were dealing, and all these layers. Of course, a lot of that seems to echo our times, uh, the tension, the dilemmas, the, the conflict. Conflicts. So, so that's been interesting doing this uh, series of parables with the, this group. Um, but this particular uh, parable caught me by surprise, I, I, in particular for the grace and the nonviolence that are part of, of this parable. And it, it's, it's like an ironic twist in the context. Um, which is why I've loved it so much. Um, just to give you a picture of our situation, we have an next door neighbor on one side who is exceedingly angry. He's a police in an inner city situation. He sees the seamier part of life. He um, lives in fear that he's gonna lose his job. He's, he feels underappreciated. And he's itching for a fight, really itching for a fight. The other side of our, our other neighbor uh, is a woman who's 70 plus years old. She's got diabetes. Her car broke down last year before the whole COVID thing. And her doctor told her she's cataracts, don't get it fixed. Um, it was going to cost too much to fix anyway. It was far more than the car was worth. So we do our grocery shopping for her and have carried on doing that. Um, and every time I go over there, she, she refuses to watch television, which is a good thing. But she, I don't know who she listens to, but she's always got some sort of conspiracy. She is, lives in absolute fear. People are out to get her, get her money, take advantage of her. She doesn't sleep at night. She just, so we've got this anger, fear thing going in our, in our neighborhood. Um, and, and it just, it, I, found, I found a similarity in this, in this, this gospel. I mean, in this parable, uh, the situation made me think of what was going on. And so I feel like, like the message of grace is a beautiful one. Uh, there's a few other things I like about it, but let me just tell it to you. So this is from uh, chapter 13. Um, some people came and reported to Jesus that Pilate had spilled the blood of some Galileans while they were in, in Jerusalem to make their sacrifice. <sighs> Jesus spoke to him and he spoke to the people around him. He said, um, are you thinking that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you, unless you repent, 
turn to God, you too will perish. Think about those 18 who were crushed to death when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Were they the worst sinners in all of Jerusalem? No. You will perish, I'm telling you, unless you repent. And then Jesus told him this parable. There was a landowner who had a fig tree in his garden. And again and again, he went and visited this tree, hoping for some fruit. Ah, every time he left, disappointed, there was no fruit. So he called his gardener and he said to him, look, we've waited three years and this tree has not produced one piece of fruit. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in my garden. But the gardener said, no, give it a second chance. Wait a year. I'll give it special attention. I'll loosen the soil around it and put lots of manure on the tree. In a year, we'll see. If it produces fruit, great. If not, then you can cut it down. So that's the parable we've fondly titled the parable of manure. Uh, for me, isolation has been that manure. <laughs> and then the not being able to, to travel and work with the people like we work with, having to do everything long distance, having to stay isolated from friends, um, it feels tough, but I think the blessing out of this is that conversation between the landowner, the, the gardener, that's the, the grace applied. And what surprise, wonderful surprise for me in this is that it's the, the gardener who does the hard work. It's the gardener who's, I'll give it special attention. Uh, so, as I've wandered through these months of, of isolation, um, it's the parable of manure that's, that's, that's been encouraging to me. That's stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so comments uh, typed, and you can also be doing talking at the same time as we're getting a little close to time. Janet, I just want to share this with you real quick. Uh, my father, the late Floyd Green, always used to say, in order for us to grow and to be and to become the authentic human creatures that we've each been created to be, we have to figure out a way to turn our shit into fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> but that, that dung metaphor, you know, we gotta, we gotta turn it into something good. <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when the Society of Biblical Literature was in Argentina, I was translating for somebody talking about this parable and instantly realized I didn't know any polite words <laughs> for shit. <laughs> so I just had to translate it with the words I had. Alas. Uh. Yeah, I liked, I liked that Jesus was trying to sort it out when you were telling it. I mean, he's like, <laughs> am I hearing you right? Is this what you're... Oh, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> I just, I had this image of half of the group ready to turn run, and run back to Galilee out of fear, like <laughs> my neighbor on one side, and the other just like gathering up whatever they could at hand, ready to blast their way into to Jerusalem, itching for a fight. Uh, and, and so Jesus trying to be the message of, of nonviolence, or it's going to go a different way that you're not expecting. So yes, that was my translation. Nah, it doesn't work that way. <laughs>
Time for just a couple more comments. I like that you are perceptive of the multiple layers of stress and anxiety that we're just sort of piling on. Uh, sometimes in our glossing over things quickly, we miss stuff like that. If I may make a comment, Marty, I, I, you're, I, I am troubled too. What is this, uh, you know, the repenting and perishing? And that to me is the irony, the sort of tongue in cheek, but what, what keeps us from, from being cut down isn't uh, that I've been less of a sinner than my neighbor or um, that I've, I've managed to stay, you know, in the center of the pack and not be the outstanding one that gets cut down um, in some way. But it's the, it's the attention of the gardener that 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 brings about the 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 change. And I I just I find I find that uh, almost a sense of Jesus. having not a not a joke but like adding wit to the whole picture and i loved what you did with the manure and the gardener and at the same time i can't <clears throat> avoid connecting it to the rest of the fig tree stories in that gospel yeah oh, well yeah not a happy ending <laughs> not a happy ending <laughs> but i think to me that's that's what makes this one so surprising right because you can't help but hear or imagine those other stories. And then that's not what happens in this story. And, and, and so, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's part of what makes this parable so startling is we, we've been conditioned to expect an ending to the fig tree story that doesn't, doesn't come. Well, it doesn't happen yet. Well, that's what, I, yeah, it's, it's you don't know how it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with this kind of, with this kind of gardener, who's to say what will happen next year? Right? If that's how the, if that's how, if that's what this gardener does, uh, so that so I think it's actually really significant that we don't we don't get that the that, that we don't see what happens after this at the end of this year. It seems right. to be this constant theme too of like it's not like if you work real hard and produce this fruit you you know you earn or become something. It's sort of like fruit is indicative of what you really are. So if you're not seeing what you're liking to see, you get to ask yourself you know, to go back and figure out who you are in the first place. Um, so there's sort of a, a difference between, you know, of, of cause and effect and, and indicative versus causative nature of fruit. But I don't know if that helps at all. But. Okay, we're gonna go to Elizabeth next. Thanks everybody. Um, so um, I know uh, that for all of us, uh, this is a very challenging time, needless to say. On a personal level, um, I'll say this, that for me, the COVID pandemic is the secondary challenge um, that I've been facing since March and that I've come through. I have experienced some darkness unlike anything I've been through. And um, so I have chosen this story, the epiphany story for Matthew for a number of reasons. Um, mainly, I love that it's unique to Matthew. It's a one of a kind story, if you will. Um, but it's also a, a story about a journey of a whole lot of unknowns, right? Um, we have these three characters, the Magi who come from another place far away and uh, they're looking for something. They're looking to find out, you know, what's this star about? Um, what is this light? What is this that is guiding us? And so when I think of the darkness that I entered into in March and have come through, and the darkness that, you know, the global darkness that we're all in right now, and how heavy and weighty and uh, scary it is, I think about this story, um, the journey in Epiphany. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate, and I, I'm sort of following you, Janet, here, 
um, is that, you know, when we encounter the character of Herod, we are running into our fear, right? He was afraid, like, who are these magi and who is this baby? Um, very afraid. But the magi come and say, you know what? Uh, we, we don't know what we're doing here. We don't, we're not too sure what we're looking for, but we're following this light and we want to follow it to, to, to its end result. So I think that part of the teaching there is that, you know, we learn from Herod that fear stops love. And we learn from the Magi that love stops fear. And I think in this pandemic thing, um, we can get so tripped up with our fears that stop love. But that includes everything that you named, Janet, the anxiety, um, the isolation, the, the mental health issues, the, the, the addiction issues, um, the, the, the wondering like who, what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen to my family? What's good for, for you beautiful American people? What's happening um, at Thanksgiving and Christmas? I mean, this is just terrifying. But the, the, the thing that I find so hopeful and meaningful in this story is that the, the light of Christ, the light of God, no matter what, whatever condition we're in, is always shining on us. It's always there, but it's always calling us and guiding us to move forward, to, to go on in our trusting in God, and then ultimately uh, to bring our gifts. And I resonate with the Magi uh, in this time of feeling like foreigners, because I th we're all foreigners as a result of COVID. Our lives have changed. And so now we are navigating through a new time on a new way, on a new road with the light of Christ shining. So I will do my best now to share. And I should say, I've just started new ministry at a church called Epiphany. So if there is one biblical story that is tattooed within me now, it's this one. So, <clears throat> At the time of King Herod, after Jesus had been born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is this child who has been born King of the Judeans? For we have observed his star at its rising and well, we've come to pay him homage. <laughs> when King Herod heard this, he became frightened and all Jerusalem with them. Whew, they were so scared. So Herod called together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where Messiah was to be born. And well, they told him, they said, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been foretold by the prophet who said, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod secretly summoned the Magi. And he learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go, go and search diligently for the child. And when you find him, bring me word so that I too may go and pay him homage. Well, after the Magi heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were, oh, they were overwhelmed with joy. Well, then upon entering the house, they found the child with his mother, Mary, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts, 
gifts of, of, of gold and, and of frankincense and of myrrh. And then, uh, well, after having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country, but by another road, by another road. We're all on another road now, aren't we? We're all on a journey. We've changed direction, but we're going towards the light. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening me to tell that story. <laughs> for comments in the thing and you could start talking to us if you have something you want to share. I never heard that other road. I mean, I never heard that other road. Thank you for calling that out. No, that other road is important. That other road is important. And I think that some way, shape or form, we're all on it. And it sure isn't pleasant right now. But maybe one of the things about this story is they came to Jerusalem one way, the way it was before, perhaps. And, uh, and they left a different way. And maybe that's the shakeup that we're all going through right now that there is going to be new way there is going to be new life love will stop fear and and you know we just have to trust that journey i guess and 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 share it together um it's unpleasant you know that myrrh is heavy uh but um i, I just love this story for so many reasons so thank you marty I appreciate that. Another road. When I experienced your change of emotion as a listener, that caused me to think about the passage differently than what I have been accustomed to read. And it sort of brings out that sense of performing and how that impacts listeners differently, depending on who's performing. Uh, and I was in a meditation group where somebody's even just reading it. Two different people read the same passage. And the first time I heard these people do it, I say, you already read it. Why do you have to read it again? It's a waste of time. And, but I'm sitting there listening to two people reading the identical passage and just enjoy sitting back and listening. And so I appreciated listening to you. Thank you, everyone. I, I loved sharing it. I love telling it with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jason, are you still here? Yep, you're up. I'm here. Um, uh, quarantining is uh, kind of a new thing that we're all experiencing right now. Maybe some of us have done it in little ways. I find myself hearing different ways of quarantining, like before you go up into lower earth orbit, but we're all quarantining right now. And I think um, it just depends on, I mean, everything quarantining with people or quarantining alone all brings its own challenges. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time um, like Janet in solitude, uh, isolation, I should say. Solitude sounds like I chose it. Isolation. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I'm just thinking about this story. I'm, I'm in Mark's uh, 10th chapter. And just thinking about what, it, what does it mean to, to ask for help or to, or to come to Jesus at all and to ask. Um, that was just kind of my, my wondering sitting with this story. James and John, Boanerges, they came to Jesus and they said to him, Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. 
when Jesus said, what, what do you want me to do for you? He said, grant us to sit at your yamin in your left hand in your glory. And Jesus said, you, you, you don't know what you're asking. And they came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, uh, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were standing by sternly ordered him, shh to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still, and he said to them, call him here. And they, yeah, yeah, they said to him, get up, take heart, he's, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, anapadesas, he resurrected. Elthin prost on you soon, and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Rabbi, let me see again. And Jesus said, go. Your faith has saved you. <laughs> Immediately, he gained his sight, and, and he followed Jesus on the way. This is a story of our people and what a story it is. All right, you know the drill by now. I just loved it. Jason, I loved it. It was so good to see you and do your thing and, you know, bring fresh air into the story. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love how you concluded. This is the story of our people and what a story it is. I had forgotten about that. So I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, the way that you, you brought in the different languages and, mm -hmm. you know, just all your amazingness. It was excellent. So thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. You're so Canadian. I love it. We're not out of the weeds yet, by the way. He has I, to be, uh, we have to get to inauguration day. That's January 20th, I think, is when <laughs> I will do any kind of celebrating. Okay. All right. Good for you. You look great. Thanks. And I can't help it. I'm Canadian. What can I say? I love it. I love it. You bring in a fresh air from Canada. I appreciate how you, I mean, you have to do a little bit of light editing, right, to make sure that those stories are heard uh, side by side in the way I think they're meant to be heard side by side. Uh, Thank and what, you. It is light editing. Light, just light <laughs> editing. Just light editing. But I, I've done the same. So I, when I, I like to tell Luke 18 and 19, the end of Luke 18 and Luke 19, and that's where that story appears. And Luke's got, I do the same thing. I want to get from the story of the yeah. uh, rich ruler to the story of the blind beggar very quickly because I think they're meant to be juxtaposed in the same way, right? That, that those that, that meant to be juxtaposed right there. So I, th I think that works because it helps, it helps to bring that into relief. Uh, and we, I think we too often miss that. We get, we get hung up on what Jesus says to uh, James and John afterwards, right? And then miss that, that verbal leap. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I think a big thing for me is like, I had never heard Bartimaeus next to, uh, only, it's only when I heard the whole story of Mark, right, that I did that. And now, you know, for a while I was filming Tracy Radosevic. And so I've heard the Gospel of Mark and Phil Rudy Jones, both of them telling it. I've heard it enough times that just like, I, I just think it's a, it's a crime that the Revised Common Lectionary puts Bartimaeus by itself. Not a crime. That's a strong word. It's a devastatingly horrible crime. Okay. And that reminds me of your great use of humor in your delivery. I mean, uh, your looks and those kind of things is just like a, such a pleasure to to listen to and kind of get that, you know, amidst the seriousness of it, that it just was 
it was very pleasurable for me to listen to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think, and I think that just speaks to a big part of that, which is when he passes through other towns, he doesn't do this thing where he grabs an entire group of people with him. I, I feel like it's him and his disciples. And now all of a sudden there's this huge crowd and it's just, man, they're like the worst human beings ever, right? Like shut the F up. I cannot stand you. Oh my God, take heart, buddy. Like, I mean, it's just so, I don't know. I'm spending a lot of time watching people be nakedly, hip, nakedly hypocritical and little uh, Lindsey Graham of them. <laughs> right. And it just, yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. It's Lindsey Graham. <laughs> Sorry to be so U.S. specific, everybody outside the U.S. right now. I, I noticed the tone of uh, Bartimaeus as well. Uh, his cry almost sounded like a command right? uh, when, he, when he cries out to Jesus. Is that how you take it? I'm curious if, you know, what you're thinking there. Yeah, I mean, I just, I'm asking y'all, why has he stopped? Jesus um, stood still is the translation I use, which is, Sometimes I can't get rid of the NRSV even when I try. <laughs> can I get can I get an amen? Like that thing is down deep. I just I want to go to the Common English Bible, but I can't. Um, yeah, I just I'm wondering what's what caused him to stop. Like, and, and there's a huge crowd around him. So in Mark, it's like if you're the woman with the flow of blood, you touch his garment. This guy is just shouting, and I think he's. I mean, I almost wanted to put him in a different voice, but I didn't want to get too, I didn't want to take away from it, but I felt like maybe it was more like a Jesus, you know, like, a, like just a, like, it's, it's so embarrassing. It's just like, he can't, Jesus is like, fine. Like, but also I can't get, I can never get Jesus. No matter how much I provoke the gospel, Richard Swanson, who's not here. I can never get Jesus to be full asshole. So it's like, I feel like he's still gonna be open to whatever this guy is about, even if he's been tired. Like, I think sometimes, I don't think he's never not an asshole. I just, that was what my, was my thinking. But I, I would be interested to hear, like, why do y'all think he stopped for Bartimaeus? We, interestingly, we, were, we had commentary from folks who are doing the, you know, the deaf Bible. And they said, of course he stopped. You know, it's all the people with, sight uh, not the uh, sight who don't understand that if you keep moving those who are blind can't find you yeah and their appreciation of the handicap of the the need to have uh jesus thoroughly understand and deeply understand they love the notion that he stopped because otherwise Bartimaeus would never have known where he, where he was. Cause if he kept moving, he, he, yeah. he'd go to the wrong place. Thank you. I want to step in just to, I want to yield the rest of my time to the, to the gentle lady from Colorado because I see our time going. Thank, Thank you. you. You can, uh, you can also toss in some comments if you want, but Pam. would help if I would unmute, right? Okay. Um, I am neither, neither a scholar nor a student of Jeremiah, but these are some of the words that the prophet Jeremiah wrote, that he sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and the priests and the prophets and, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to the exiles, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens 
and eat what they produce. Take spouses and have children. Take spouses for your offspring that they may have children. Do not decrease. Multiply. Do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where you are in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Because in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Those are some of the words the prophet Jeremiah wrote. <laughs> okay, you know the drill. Yeah, Jeremiah, what did he also like write Lamentations or something? That was, uh, that was pretty, very good telling, obviously, Pam. Mm. That was brilliant. Uh, well, Pam, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I was just going to say that I, that was a, a piece that was shared in worship early in the summer uh, in my church. And in late summer, I taught a course online to clergy called Where Two or Three Are Gathered in Zoom, Using Storytelling to Enrich Online Ministry. And I shared that with them, and they really found that meaningful, they said to me, as they were trying to figure out how do you do ministry like this. And it has continued to be um, helpful to me as I'm trying to figure out how to live in this new city as a storyteller with cameras and, and with lights and all kinds of stuff. Um, so well, That's interesting to me because more than any of the other tellers, your site evoked a sacred space for me because I've been listening to you on Fridays telling in it. And so, you know, that I never thought about how digital experience too builds upon itself and creates a sacred many, uh, memory, just like physical space does. Thank you. I was particularly struck by the like, you know, keep living your life, get married, have kids as someone who like literally got courthouse COVID <laughs> married because I couldn't have the big party I wanted. That just like really resonated with me. I'm like, yeah, like we're going to be here for a while. So you may as well figure like the plant gardens. I'm thinking about my garden in my back. And it's like this idea that like life goes on, even if it's different, like don't pause everything and wait for the storm to roll through, but sort of figure out how to ride with the storm kind of thought. I really... It like hit me and I was like, I love this. Well, I have to tell you, Megan, you have given me concrete imagery <laughs> to carry with this. You, you're in my mind and heart when I tell that portion. <laughs> I want to show you our garden where we're going to be planting. Oh, good. We got an indoor uh, uh, huh? uh, lettuce thing for it. That's Lori's Christmas present. But. Oh, cool. <laughs> I love the concreteness of the hope. So I always think of hope kind of is more of an internal thing, but in this passage, it's super concrete. Yeah, I like that too. The uh, subtitle or the title of my dissertation uh, when it was published was Gardens in Babylon. Uh, I was looking at the Greek texts of Daniel, but I think they are midrashim on Jeremiah's letter. So, so I paid some attention to the letter. And, and I, I, I'm not sure that Jeremiah was offering hope so much as saying, just get used to it because it ain't going away anytime mm. soon. Is what I, so, so I was hearing my conversation with a uh, elderly colleague last night, and he's just sick of it. I mean, he is so grumpy and whiny, and he's tired of it. And I don't think he was happy when I said, if we're moving the wine bar indoors, we got to wear masks. Um, you know, but but what do you say? Yeah. Except it ain't gonna go away just because we're tired of it. Yeah, Marty, 
figure out what we can do. Yeah, it actually has been at times about hope, but much more for me is, you know, kind of a, <laughs> we all know the phrase, bloom where you're planted. Well, this is, this is, this is what I got. This is what you want to be planted here, but. <laughs> but this is what you got. This is where you are planted, where I am planted. So yeah, don't just wither away. Don't just sulk. Uh, you got to lament sometimes, but build houses, plant gardens, be Martin Luther and plant an apple tree, you know? Um, yeah, so that's, that's been helpful to me. And he didn't ask them to be subversive. Like every chance you get, you know, ruin the society there because they're the bad guys saying, hey, you're going to be helpful to your enemies who ruined your life. It's sort of an interesting uh, grace. But it's where you live. So, so contribute where I can to where I live. Uh, um, so a, a little bit, it's been, I, I've, I've revisited over so many months and it, it you know, like any, any good story or piece of poetry or good letter you know it it does it is multi-layered and it does shine differently at different times so pam your garden uh just now that you're sharing with us was beautiful and i say that uh metaphorically with um the course that you offered for clergy which unfortunately i could not do because i was in the middle of moving um and starting new ministry but uh, I, I hope and pray that you will offer it again um, and, and, and so that we can get on board because your effect, I mean, you are an amazing storyteller. You know I, that I, I, I love that about you. But um, the way that, I, that you sort of started back at your screen and you got a bit closer and you got a bit closer and you got a bit closer, that was powerful. And I have to say, God, I thought that was so brave. I'm not sure I would stick my face into the camera that up close necessarily, but it was, but, the, but, but you did it and, and it, it showed courage and vulnerability and it just fit with, uh, with that story and, and, and to, to be where you are and, and bring the best of who you are and, and, and to grow where you are, um, just so powerful. Um, and so I, I want to, I just want to thank you for that. And I really hope and pray you've got my backup support. If you run the clergy course again for, for digital stuff, I'm in. All right. And I've got witnesses now. So thank you. <laughs> I'll be in touch. So, and, and I just noticed um, Cliff's comment about appreciating that I stopped short of the bumper sticker first. <laughs> yeah, I debated, but no, I wanted to end where I ended it. So thanks for noting that. I'm gonna um, draw us to a close. Uh, so I'll, first I'll ask, is there anybody who has any concerns about something they said they don't want to go out on the video? You can either tell me now or email me. Um, all right, just because I want, I promised you that. So I wanna just mention the next two things, oh, three things. You're gonna get an email from me inviting you to a Google, a doodle poll to figure out times to meet. We want to vary the times um, because some people can come to one time and some people never can, like this time, some people never can come to this time. And so we want to keep the time moving around. Um, so I'm going to give you, it'll, I don't think doodle poll lets me do general time. So it'll be specific times, but just know I'm asking you how are Friday nights, how are Monday nights, how are Tuesday nights? uh our mornings um so that'll be coming soon and then the, what we'll do in december is i what i mentioned earlier we'll look at large stories longer longish stories from the hebrew scripture that open up interesting things when they're laid beside the first eight chapters of the gospel of mark uh and so we're, we're still working on our intertextual theme and so um we'll discuss that and I'm also working on a thing, trying to figure out what buttons Mark is pushing with the prologue story. And they can be shorter things. They don't have to be longer stories. Where do you hear um, Mark hoping that our memories will uh, run to uh, as you're hearing the prologue? So you can email me though. If you're not able to attend the thing, you can email me those 
and we'll, we're working on this weaving that we want to have done and our what we're proposing to the board is to do two-year epics on mark so do the first half of mark and the second half of mark and both time do intertext work so that you're hearing both uh, Mark's witness over and against the larger Hebrew scriptures witness. All right. Um, I have to go play games with my children. And so we're done. <laughs> That's what we do on Monday night. So it's part of planning. Thank you all for showing up. Living in your house. <laughs> thank you, Phil, for making this happen. Yep. Thanks. Be well, y'all. Thank here, you to all our storytellers. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Stay safe.